Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is a special sneak preview of Assassins, a brand new documentary, uh, and really one of the most uh, bizarre stranger than fiction stories I've seen in quite some time. Uh, it's presented courtesy of Greenwich Entertainment and following the screening of the film, which will run here directly in the webinar, uh, we'll have a live Q and A with director producer Ryan White, producer Jessica Hargrave and associate editor and SCA alum Darshan Kimbabi. Um, Assassins will debut on um, video on demand starting January 15th. So if you wanna recommend it to anyone, uh, that's the best, uh, best way to do it. So I hope that you'll stick around and uh, I really hope that you enjoy the film. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, uh, welcome back. Thank you for joining us for the discussion. Uh, we're now joined by the uh, director, producer, Ryan White, uh, the producer, Jessica Hargrave, and associate editor and our very own SCA alum, Darshan Kimbabi. Welcome guys. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, and I saw just at the end there the credit for the article that inspired all of this. Uh, so I would love to know uh, at what point in the story uh, you came across the article and then actually began filming. You know, there's, uh, there's archival material here. So sometimes the trickery of cinema makes us feel like you're there from the beginning. But, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious to know what the access point was for you all. Um, we were there pretty early on. We actually, uh, we remember when there was, when this happened and the headline said that Kim Jong-nam had been assassinated in February, 2017. And, you know, I remember seeing that it was two female assassins and thinking that was remarkable, but quickly getting wrapped up in the news of the time, which was Trump's first full off, full month in office, excuse me. And so U.S. news was dominated by that. And I lost this path and I didn't honestly think much more of it until we got a phone call. It was just a couple months later from Doug Bach Clark, the journalist you referenced, who said, I don't know if you guys remember this. We said, yeah, he said, there's a lot more to the story and you guys should think about looking into it. Um, he had lived in Indonesia for years and he speaks the language and he is, um, he had, he was working on an article um, and he was, he said, you know, I've already started looking into this. I've started meeting with sources, but I, was thinking maybe while I do that, you guys could could come along if you're interested. Um, so a couple weeks later, Ryan was on a plane with him to Malaysia to start, you know, figuring out if this is a story that we could follow. And uh, when you got to Malaysia, what were the first things you had to do? I mean, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of obviously a lot of footage that that's gleaned from news, but also surveillance. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, you know, taking the inspiration from the article, what the first logistical steps were? Well, the first trip was more of an exploratory trip. It was, it was very impulsive to get on a flight to Malaysia, but Doug's article was so incredible. But uh, honestly, we were skeptical of the story. You know, I think as documentary filmmakers were naturally skeptical, um, but we thought, you know, even if the women aren't telling the truth and they are trained assassins, like this is such a crazy defense for a murder trial mm -hmm. that it's worth going over there. Um, and so, like Jess said, I went with Doug and our DP, John Benham, and the trip was more about meeting Doug's sources and sussing them out for ourselves. And like every person that we met that was a part of Doug's article, but a lot of them anonymous and a lot, we were shooting anonymously, like, like John the taxi driver, I was just blown away and they were willing to go uh, to further points than they even were in Doug's article. Um, and so as we started to meet all these sources and film these interviews with them, I was starting to get pretty convinced. And then Doug introduced us to the lawyer. So Doug's article focused mostly on Siti Aisha, the Indonesian woman. Mm -hmm. um, and so he had access already to her legal team. And 
once I met them, who was led by GUI, um, and GUI was so open to allowing us into the legal offices. And we've made films, we've made multiple films about uh, lawsuits or trials before, and they can be very difficult to make because lawyers are very conservative, understandably. Uh, and GUI was very open from the very beginning um, and very vocal from the very beginning, you know, kind of shouting from the rooftops, my clients innocent in North Korea did this. So I knew we had characters as well. Um, and so as long as we were anchored with them that we would be able to, you know, have characters that last throughout the trial, throughout the film. Uh, and so that was the first trip. And then it became about trying to get access to everyone. And that, that included Dewan's legal team, that included Siti's family, Dewan's family. And I mean, this, this all took a lot of time. It's not like all those people, you know, agreed to participate from the very beginning, um, but slowly they did. Um, and Darshan, I think is actually the best person to speak about um, getting access to the CCTV footage since he was the, sort of hero back home in Los Angeles who had to inherit thousands of hours from a million different cameras all over the airport. And we sort of threw it on his desk once we got our hands on it and said, all right, piece it all together. So why don't you speak to that, Darshan? <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. Uh, this is, uh, it's really awesome. Yeah, Ryan's right. I think uh, because of the access that we got to the lawyers, what happened was initially when the case broke, there was this whole like, uh, issue. Uh, apparently, there was some amount of CCTV footage that got leaked to this Japanese press agency. So the lawyers didn't get all of the, the, the recordings. They just got like snippets of all the CCTV recordings at the airport. So when it arrived uh, from the cops to the, law, uh, to the legal team, it was like on 25 to 30 DVDs, completely like with no labeling and just like no time codes, no like breakdown of which camera is where. And it was just like, uh, it, it, it was just like a mountain of footage with like weird names, frame rates, and half of them wouldn't open on a Mac. So then you had to buy another burner computer to kind of like be like, hey, if our computers get hacked, then we shouldn't have this on there. So let's get another burner computer. Uh, so initially when I started on the project, that was like my first big task was to take all the CCTV footage and kind of make sense of it. Uh, so basically all the North Koreans that exist on the footage, I had to go and track each of them and their movements, you know? So mm -hmm. there would be like a five minute video from one angle, but then that wouldn't match up with like another camera angle. So I basically like decoded everything put up like this wall of like, kind of like what you see in like Law and Order or NCIS with like a photo wall of like mug shots and connecting what time they got here, what time they got here. Uh, and then eventually we had like a five hour master timeline of like uh, uh, them arriving at like 6 a.m. and basically their footsteps of what they did throughout the events up until the assassination and then also how they got out of the country by like putting on this ruse of like changing clothes and pretending to be different people and everything exists on those cctv cameras so yeah that sounds grueling but also awesome like it, it, it was fun yeah <laughs> like finding it's like the missing puzzle piece mm -hmm. like, I, I'm curious if, if, if it was the footage itself that was like the aha moment for you guys as filmmakers that kind of made you believe in their innocence or if it was the story constructed by the lawyers. I mean, the film makes a very compelling case, but I'm curious what in real life did it for you? It wasn't the lawyers because you never trust lawyers, especially defense attorneys, because they're <laughs> always going to spin things. And we knew that. So it wasn't it wasn't the lawyers telling us what their clients did. It was once the lawyers handed over all of the evidence to us, because the, the, the weird part that was happening was the longer the trial went on, the more we started to think these women might be innocent. But also the longer the trial went on, the more likely it looked like they were gonna be convicted and executed. Like everybody on the ground was telling us, oh, these women are screwed, they're gonna die. Uh, and that especially seemed apparent once the judge made his first ruling after the prosecution put forward its case, 
And he basically said, you know, I don't believe these women, they're lying. Um, and so all signs pointed towards their execution. Um, meanwhile, we're inheriting all this evidence, the text messages, the Facebook profiles, the flight paths, you know, proving that they had been flying around Southeast Asia, you know, on the supposed reality show. But I think what, what really solidified in our minds that these women might be innocent was what Darshan was doing. The CCTV footage, you know, like the lawyers can spin something, but the lawyers didn't have the CCTV footage at the beginning when we began this film to prove that story. So once Darshan was piecing together the whole day, and then you can see that the CCTV footage totally corroborates everything that the women are saying is going on. Um, and you see their behaviors, which don't seem like people that are about to assassinate someone. And you see the way that Duan returns to the airport the next day, like all of these things that seemed uh, so suspicious at the beginning, you know, the woman in the LOL sweatshirt who smiles at the camera, they look like these femme fatales. You start unpacking all of that once you get to just watch the day play out over the course of six hours uh, and you get to see I think in the evidence and their behavior, how innocent they might be, but also you get to see the evidence and behavior of all the North Koreans that show how calculated and nefarious they were. Uh, so I think it's once, you know, we started that whole timeline that Darshan did that we were saying like, holy shit, they, everything that they said happened that day plays out on camera. Did any of that work that um, Darshan was doing play back into the defense's strategy? Or, or was it sort of completely separate? Well, the, the irony, but sort of the cool part uh, for us as filmmakers was the defense never went in this trial. You know, it was all a lead up to the defense putting on their case. And then those, I guess there's no spoilers here because everybody just watched the film that's on this Zoom link. Uh, you know, the total curveball when the women were released just as Dwan was about to begin her case and then Siti would have gone. So, you know, that, that was a total shocker, probably like the most shocking moment of my filmmaking career, but it gave us this really unique opportunity as filmmakers where the truth never came out in the courtroom and it never came out in the press there. So basically these women were holding the truth in their heads and their defense teams knew the truth and were about ready to put it on the stand and it never happened. Mm -hmm. So we had this opportunity to be like the only people holding the truth and being able to put it out there uh, in the world. I think the defense team would have loved with the press attention that this was getting to get to do that during the trial, but they never got the opportunity. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about like what kind of permission you needed from like the Malaysian government. But I want to also know if the fact that you had pieced all of this together and were telling, you know, you were prepping to tell this story in a way that could reach people all over the world, if that had any play in the sort of political pressure on them to release the women. It's an interesting question whether it had any influence. And Perhaps it did. I mean, I don't know that we'll know for sure, but certainly people were aware that we were making the film um, and that we were planning to release it. One of our thoughts had been when we were so convinced that the women would be executed as we thought, let's rush and make this so that as soon as they're convicted, we can release it right away and help get this out into the world and let more people know the story because so many people had lost sight of it. So that was one of the things that we were planning to do. We didn't have to do that in the end, thank goodness, but it was one of our plans. And I think that Certainly people may have been aware that, that we were making it and we were planning to bring it to a wide audience. In terms of permissions, <laughs> um, I'm sure that they should have been gotten. Um, they were not gotten, they, uh, you know, in, in terms of being able to, allowed to film there and, and things like that. Ryan is pushing it on being able to pass as a backpacker, no offense, but <laughs> he's still going for it. I turned 40 this year. It's, it's not gonna last much longer. We've been doing that for decades, pretending to be backpackers. So that's a ticking clock, yeah. <laughs> um, but we really didn't. I, the thing that's interesting about this, I mean, in general, we try to be very small and we don't love to, to, to raise a flag and ask for permission when we don't have to, but. What was particularly concerning about this story is that governments were involved in it, you know? So it's like, 
because of the nationalities of the women and obviously the fact so it's the, the Indonesian government, the Vietnamese government and the Malaysian government were all involved in this story. And it's not just like you're covering some story within the country. It's like, it's on a bigger scale than that. So to, to alert people seemed risky. And so we just avoided it. You, you, uh, you mentioned t talking, to, I mean, you know, um, making contact with the families. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about uh, actually the relationship to Siti and Duan themselves. Uh, like at what point did that happen for you? What sorts of conversations did you have to have with them? What, you know, like what, what was that like? What was their uh, sort of um, understanding of what you were making, um, you know, and how did they feel about it? Yeah, well, both both were very different, not just they're very different people, but very different ways of getting access to them. Siti was released first. She was also the one that we had the most connections with because of Doug, the journalist, had, you know, for, we spent years making this film and he had spent a year before that writing the article. So for years, we had been in touch with her family by then. So by the time, and Doug, Doug lived in Indonesia forever. He speaks the language. So he was in well with that family by that point. And I had been to that village a few times to film by that point. So when Siti was released, uh, we had her lawyers and her family saying like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah you know, you should participate. Uh, these guys have been following this case forever. Uh, so she was quite easy uh, to get access to, you know, like right after she was released, we flew over. Well, the Indonesian government had her in hiding for a little bit, which Vietnam also did with Duan. But once she was out of hiding or rehab, they called it, uh, then we flew over and we met Siti. Um, Duan was very different because we didn't, you know, even when I was in her village with her family, I didn't speak the language. I had a translator. Uh, we hadn't spent years following, you know, years making a connection with them. So I think I went to that village twice. Uh, and so the way I met her was when she was released, her lawyers, who I was very entrenched with that, by that point, they tipped us off to what flight she was going to be on back to Vietnam because she was released from the courtroom, went straight to the airport and was on a flight back to Vietnam. And so they, they told me, they said like, hey, by the way, we're gonna be on this flight back to Vietnam, book a seat, book it in business class because we're gonna be in business class with her. That ended up not being true. The Vietnamese government is very smart. And what they did is they booked uh, the last 10 rows of the airplane, the back of the airplane, they completely booked up empty. Um, and there was one Vietnamese agent with Duan in the back. Uh, but because I knew the lawyers by that point, they walked back with me. Um, they wouldn't let, there were other press people who had figured out which flight, but they weren't allowed back at the beginning. And it was very strange because uh, they introduced me to her, but there was a, a Vietnamese agent there trying to end it very fast. And I basically just got to say like, nice to meet you. Uh, you know, I've been following your story and I'm so happy you're free. And then that's that scene in the film where she's walking through the Vietnamese airport. She looks like a celebrity, um, you know, there's paparazzi all around her. She's put in a van and then she's taken off into hiding. Uh, and so we didn't hear for a few months and then maybe not, maybe a month she was in hiding. A month later she got out and that was the really hard part was I had her phone number, I started communicating with her. But by that point she had been influenced by the, the really nasty world around her, right? Like that moment at the airport, she's still quite naive and saying, I wanna be an actress, but that's because she, she's been in solitary confinement for two years. She hasn't, she hasn't been experiencing, you know, the vitriol and the judgment that's out there on the internet about her. Uh, and so by the time I was going to Vietnam, she was a very different person, did not wanna be an actress, did not wanna be known for, she didn't wanna be known as that girl. She was, she was hiding. She literally had made herself look different. Uh, so that was the hardest part of the film was getting her to participate because she was very, very suspicious of the outside world and understandably so because that's what got her into this whole mess. What would you say her relationship is to the film now in the sense that like on the one hand, it's, it's a really powerful sort of exoneration of what happened. And at the other, on the other hand, it's also continuing to identify her as being this person directly involved in this assassination. 
Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. The film will come out in Vietnam and you know, it's something um, that concerns me in that sense because you know, the longer this has evolved, I think that's, yeah, I mean, the, the, the year of coronavirus has warped time totally. So I guess I met her a year and a half ago. A lot of time has passed since her conviction and her return to Vietnam. So naturally she's been able to disappear, you know, like the first few weeks that she was free, it was really awful and the Vietnamese press was all over her. My understanding for both of the women is that, you know, that that has, a, that has faded away almost completely. So it is a concern that, it, I mean, it's a great question because the film really does, I think, make the argument that she was innocent all along and that she didn't deserve this, but it will probably bubble up that attention again around her. And I don't know what the release in Vietnam is going to be like. I can't imagine that they have huge releases around documentaries, but it involves one of their own, so maybe it will. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I text with her all the time. So I think when that time comes, when it comes out in Vietnam, we'll have, we'll be having a lot of conversations on, on how to deal with that. Um, Darshan, tell us after your epic uh, uh, reconstruction of the CCTV footage, <laughs> uh, what, what were the other big challenges for you? Uh, I think like the, I think the main thing is like Helen actually did most of the heavy lifting and figuring out like the big story. Helen and Ryan worked on like figuring out because also like as Ryan mentioned, you know, the trial was happening. So there were so many moving parts and there was like this uh, particular uh, time sometime around June or July when uh, uh, we apparently got access to a lot more footage and we basically came back and it was like, we had to split up the work between, because at that time we also got access to Anna uh, Fifield. So Helen started working on working on the Kim Jong-nam as a character's like story edit, because that was the first time we were like having an expert talk about the film. And then we had a bunch of footage from City and from Duan. So we had to kind of like break break down uh, the workflow in terms of like, I started working on all of Siti's background uh, as uh, in her, uh, uh, the Garmin district when she was working and then as a sex worker and then meeting with John. So I started helping Helen put those scenes together. Uh, and then Duan's stuff, uh, we bought in Reg who was uh, one of the additional editors. He started putting stuff together. It was just like, we had very little time and a lot of like moving parts happening and we wanted to make sure that we weren't missing anything. Uh, and also like, as Ryan mentioned, the biggest surprise was like when City got released because that completely like put us in a tailspin of being like, what are we gonna do now? <laughs> well, like, where does the film go from here? <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it was very, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I think the CCTV thing uh, was the first part which took my most amount of time and then after that it was pretty much most of Siti's like backstory leading up to how she met uh how she met the North Koreans mm -hmm. uh yeah because I think it's it's really important to note that the importance of that what Darshan was working on because you know for so long we didn't have access to the women so how do you have an audience care about these women relate to these women the backstory is so important and so what he was doing in building that was letting the audience connect with a woman that they otherwise just saw in a bulletproof vest surrounded by machine guns i mean it's intimidating it's scary that's what you see and that's maybe the image you first um, that is first portrayed but there's more than that and so darshan had to put a lot of that together to help the audience connect with the women um, and it's interesting what he mentioned about anna fifield the um the North Korea expert who we have speak about that. That did come very late as you remember that <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Part of that, I mean, we wouldn't have done it as late as we did, but part of that was that we had been so focused on the women. We wanted the story to be about the women. We didn't want this to be a documentary about the North Korean regime, you know? So it's like, we're telling the women's stories, but in order to understand the women's stories, you really have to understand the North Korean regime. You have to take that step back. So as much as we focus on them at some point, we realized that in order to tell that story, you had to tell the bigger story. And so we reached out to her as she's, she literally wrote the book on it. She's an expert and a really great storyteller. And we were able to track her down and get her pretty late in the game. And at that point, as Darshan was mentioning, we were like bifurcating the stories and people were working on different things and finding a way to still make it cohesive. 
Oh, it adds so much. It's really great. I'm curious, actually, because you do go into that, if you ever ran afoul of the of the U.S. State Department, because we know simultaneously to the production of this film, you know, Kim Jong Un and his best friend Donald Trump are like <laughs> planning these international summits, and um, you know, uh, North Korea strikes me as the kind of place that. Um, doesn't take too uh, fondly to investigations into their murderous uh, regime. So I'm, I'm curious if at any point uh, you guys heard anything from, from uh, officials, either from the US State Department or elsewhere. Well, just one little story about that. Uh, we never heard from the North Korean regime. I mean, they might they might be in our cell phones right now, but <laughs> <laughs> they never told us. They never told us they were there, uh, thankfully, I'm glad. Uh, but. We they haven't we hacked have... the Greenwich Entertainment servers. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. They may have, uh, but we had never. We'd made investigative stories for sure before, and we'd made dangerous stories before. We'd we'd often been in danger in the field, but we had never made something this geopolitical and this. Um, this, this, this something that involves the higher echelons of so much of the world, you know? And it's a good point. Like I often say the, the North Korean government was not what I was most afraid of in making this film, you know, like they are so isolated and far away and they, they threatened our cybersecurity, I'm sure. But our physical safety less so, I think, than I was much more uncomfortable with being in Malaysia, following a trial that was proving that they were about to convict someone who might be innocent, you know, investigating the storyline of why are they doing that? Why are they sweeping under the rug? I was very uncomfortable always filming in Vietnam, a communist country where you don't have permission to film. And I was very uncomfortable once the Kim Jong-nam connections to the American government and the Chinese government, by the way, um, were coming out. And that's why he was such a threat to Kim Jong-un. Uh, but what I'll never forget, like, Doug, the journalist, has this has been his beat for a long time, and Anna Fifield. So they were really kind of our shepherds in some way of saying like, you know, like sometimes Anna would text me and I would be like, ah, oh, like aren't aren't the North Koreans gonna be reading this? And she's like, no, chill out. Like they're not they're not following me all the time, you know. So she was kind of saying like, this is what you should be worried about. This is what you shouldn't. And Doug was doing the same thing. But I remember we had a lunch with Doug in North Carolina where he lives. At some point during the the movie and first of all he made us he made us take out the batteries of our cell phones and turn them off which felt like living in a spy movie and I'm very reckless so I'm like do we really have to do this like this feels so like you're pretending to be an investigative journalist <laughs> then we did and then he told us that he had just heard from the American government we were about to travel there we had just traveled there or something we were about to travel there because the the message from I can't remember if it was the State Department, I think it was the CIA, someone from the CIA, Jess might remember, that said like, hey, while you're there, you might wanna sit down with us or something to that effect. So like they knew we were going and they were saying, while you're there, why don't you come in and meet with us? And Doug was like, fuck no, we are not going to meet with them. <laughs> <laughs> but that was crazy. That was like the idea of like people are tracking us and it's not the Kim regime. I'm sure they were tracking us, but like the American government somehow knows, uh, knows what we're making and they're tracking Doug at least and they know that we're about to travel there. And that I'm telling you will like, that will inspire a lot of paranoia because then you're wondering everything in your life that the American government or these other governments might be looking at. So do you keep your cell phone in the freezer now? <laughs> I'm very reckless, like I said. So. Wait, what, what, what did Anna say you should watch out for? Uh, Anna, I mean, Anna's so brave and she's been doing it for so long that she's very fearless, you know? Like I even remember we, we, we shot some, um, we shot some footage of Anna that didn't make it into the film. We, we filmed our interview with Anna in Hong Kong. I happened to be in Hong Kong uh, for a film festival and she happened to be coming through to cover the protests because she was based in Beijing. We've been trying to meet her for months. And so we happened to meet her in Hong Kong and we just wanted to get a little B-roll with her. And so we shot her after our interview, we followed her to the airport. So we shot some footage of her in a taxi and then getting on the train and going to the airport. None of it made it in the film, but I always remember Anna, we're filming shots of her just like sitting on a train and 
some guy says to her, he notices the cameras and he notices she's being filmed, but we're far away, but we can hear her because she has a microphone on. He says like, oh, uh, why are those guys filming you? And she just like unadulterated is like, oh, they're making a film about the assassination of Kim Jong Nam <laughs> and I'm a journalist. She's been to North Korea multiple times. And it just, it just proved to me that like, there's so much, I've seen this in many, many films that like, there's such a heightened fear about these things that feel so scary to us. And I'm like, the woman who literally wrote the book on Kim Jong-un is telling a stranger right now exactly what we're doing and she isn't afraid. So I don't think she's, a, I don't think she's afraid of a lot. Um, I'm seeing that we're getting a bunch of questions. So um, what I'm gonna do is I like to invite people over to turn on their cameras and ask their questions live. So for those of you watching, um, I'm gonna put together sort of a, a running order of the questions uh, of who I'm gonna call on so that you can prep yourselves. Um, if you don't want to be um, on camera, you can either just use your microphone and keep your video off, or in the questions that you type, just put moderator, please read, and I'll just read them out loud. Um, and but while I'm looking at the questions, uh, tell us a little bit about um, how people will be able to find the film because I know it's coming out on on demand right on uh, Friday. Yes. yes. <laughs> That's it. Uh, <laughs> Amazon, iTunes, anywhere. Yeah. Yes, it's uh, <laughs> what, what do they call that? Premium video on demand now. So I think people can rent it on um, Amazon and iTunes starting on Friday. It's right now it's in virtual cinemas, which is so cool where people could just buy a ticket to any indie theater around the country and stream it on their computers. So um, that's the way. If you're going to tell people to watch it, I say tell them to watch in that direction because it's supporting in independent theaters that are struggling right now. Um, I, don't, I don't think Amazon's hurting as much or Apple, so. <laughs> um, uh, before, okay, so before I, I invite some people over, there's just, I'm seeing one question that sort of builds upon what we were talking about in terms of feeling um, like there might be some, some threats about the fact that the film was made. Do you feel like the release is now um, bringing back any of that anxiety, knowing that it's gonna get out there and seen? I think that there is some anxiety. I mean, that's part of my role in this is to carry the anxiety, you know, and and in the making of the film, we were careful as Darshan talked about burner computers, keeping things off the internet. Um, it's on the internet now, you know, like it's like sort of was like a release in some ways It increases the fear, but it's also kind of like it's out of my hands and it's out there. The other thing, I mean, in addition to reminding ourselves all the time about how brave all these other people are, like Anna and like the lawyers who every day were pointing the finger, you know, in press conferences away from their clients and towards the regime. So as brave as they are, and as much as I remind myself of that, I also think about the fact that this was a spectacle, perhaps for a reason, you know, like, is this that upsetting that we're covering something that could have been done in a much quieter way? I don't know. So yes, there's still fear. And I think that there's anxiety about it. And that's justified based on the history and what we've seen. Obviously, everyone's thinking about the Sony hacks. So I'll say it out loud. Like there's things like that that, are, that have happened and could happen. So yes, there's fear. We tried to protect and still do as much as we can. Uh, but you can't prevent everything. And I'll just add, um, I don't think Jess just said this. Uh, mm. I feel like our film, uh, you know, besides the fact that Jess is saying he, cre he, they created a spectacle for a reason. So I'm not sure us telling, like they wanted this attention. So we might just be feeding into the North Koreans interest of giving this more publicity, but also because of Anna Fifield in our film, and this is really what her book does. And I, I recommend everyone reads the book. It's, it, it, it's like a page turner, uh, but it, our film, because of our interview with her, I think very respectfully treats Kim Jong-un's rise to power. And for so long, you know, the Sony hack is spawned because the interview treated him like a man baby. And I think they like blow him up at the end of the film and that angered him, you know? And so many, for so long in our like cultural vernacular, Kim Jong-un has been a punchline. And Kim Jong-il, his father was a punchline too. He was in Team America in the same type of way. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to say we're playing into our, their hands, but our film is the story about how he defied the odds and what role this assassination played in consolidating that power. And for better or worse, and mostly worse, Kim Jong-un has succeeded at that. And so, um, you know, I, I hope he would look at our film and say, oh, this is one of the, one of the few things out there that treats me as a real threat. <laughs> 
not as a punchline or a joke. And that's the truth. He is a real terrifying threat to the world. So um, just looking through the audience questions, I feel like there is a decent amount of overlap with some of the things that we've already talked about. So I'm just gonna try and pluck out a few that um, allow us to talk about some, some new things. So Robin, I'm gonna move you over and uh, feel free to turn on your video and moving you now. Oh, hi. Hey, Robin. I was hoping you would just ask the question. Can you hear me? Oh, but I wanted to hear your voice. <laughs> you are so sweet. So it was an amazing movie. And um, unfortunately, I had a delivery at a crucial point in the movie. <laughs> and I could not avoid it. And so I had to figure out, I'm still unclear. So the second woman, I guess it's CD, right? She Did the Malaysian government eventually start pressuring what actually happened to get her released? Hmm. Well, we'll never, we'll never truly know what happened because this all happened behind the scenes. It was, it was foreign diplomacy at the highest levels and a lot of puppeteering, but uh, <laughs> the, the uh, city was released because the Indonesian government started putting a lot of pressure on the Malaysian government after the judge had made his ruling where he clearly thought they were guilty and there is not a jury system in Malaysia, that judge would have ultimately made the ruling on their lives um, and had them hanged. And so once he made his ruling, Indonesia started putting on some big pressure on, on the Malaysian government behind the scenes, um, which is what led to that total curveball surprise in the courtroom when Siti was released. Like the judge didn't even know that was coming. No one knew that was coming. Siti barely knew that was coming. She found out a few minutes before, uh, before she went into the courtroom. Uh, and so if that had never happened, I, I think both girls would be dead. I think if the Indonesian government had not put on that pressure, this would be a totally, I don't even know what this, I don't even know if we'd have a film because I don't know how we would have put that out into the world, a film that proves someone's innocence after they died. And then what happened after Siti was released was Dewan was still on death row and was still having to face trial um, with the same judge who had said they were guilty. And so the Vietnamese government had to choose whether they stepped up uh, and put on the same type of pressure or whether they abandoned their citizen in Malaysia. And they were looking very, very bad in the international spotlight for not coming uh, to their girl's defense. And so they did, they did it like the, uh, the 11th hour, they came um, and showed up in the courtroom and um, Dewan was released as a result. The difference being, Siti was released as if she was never charged, which is crazy. So she spent two months uh, in solitary confinement facing the death penalty. And it was like, the prosecution just pulled the case. Like we never charged her. Dewan to be released, because I think they needed some accountability um, and they weren't willing to do that for both girls. Dewan had to plead guilty uh, to the murder. Um, and they were willing to like downgrade the, that charge in some way, kind of like we do here with manslaughter. Um, but she is a convicted murderer for the rest of her life. Thank you. Thank you. Byzantine, incredible plot, man. You fell on an amazing story. Thank you. Um, and on that note, and sorry, Robin, I'm gonna move you back to attendee. Um, someone was asking if there's any chance this is gonna be made into a feature narrative. Uh, it seems like this kind of story like the life rights have to have been bought at some point, right? Uh, I mean, we've we've definitely thought about that, and we've I, I think it could be or it would be an amazing film as documentary filmmakers by trade. Like to me, I'm like this is the best way to tell it. It's a stranger than fiction story, and we but it's true, and we already showed you that it's true. So, I mean, we talk about it, and we wonder about it, and it might be, but um, but to me, we we told it. This is the right way to tell it. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, I'm going to bring over Sally. Hi, Sally. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Oh, hey. um, First of all, congratulations for a really great film and also a great film about the situation of most women in the developing world um, in particular, women who are particularly vulnerable to getting roped into things because they have no other possibilities 
of surviving and possibly also helping their families. So thank you for that as well. But I wanted to know about the lawyers um, because they seemed very impressive and actually kind of um, either major, the leading human rights lawyers or else um, criminal defense lawyers. Mm -hmm. How did they get involved and who was paying because these young women did not have any money? Mm -hmm. Um, they, they were both very high profile criminal defense lawyers, both teams were, so you're right. They're very, very good lawyers. And you're also right that the women were not paying for them. So in the case of Siti being an Indonesian citizen, her attorney, Gui, his firm has a deal that any Indonesian citizen who is charged with a capital crime and risks losing his or their life um, in Malaysia, that case automatically goes to his firm. So you know, the attorneys read about the case and then they read about the assassins. And then when they read that the woman was in the city, at least was Indonesian, they knew it was their case. Um, for Duan, Hicham is also a very high profile attorney and he was hired and selected by the Vietnam Bar Association and then the Vietnamese government was, was paying for him. But you're right that they're very good lawyers. Um, and so they were well represented and would have been well represented if they'd ever gone to the, um, the stage of defense. But as you saw, it seemed like the judge had, had made up his mind in many ways anyway. I just want to thank you, congratulate you, and wish you the best with this film and future projects too. Thanks thank so much, you. Sally. Thank you, Sally. <clears throat> um, before I go out to Gigi, I wanted to ask this question. Um, Brian Fogel, uh, the director of The Dissident, spoke recently about lack of offers to distribute his documentary after great success at Sundance. Did you have any difficulty financing or distributing this film due to the sensitive or controversial nature of the subject matter and erratic behavior of North Korea? Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the answer is yes. Uh, it was a very interesting film to make in that way because we're often, you know, like when, when, like to go back to the first, the beginning of the conversation, when we're on those flights to Malaysia, you know, two weeks after we've, we've filmed that we've heard the story from Doug, we're paying for all of this, right? You're not like going to Netflix that early in a process and they're not giving you money to do something like this. And so Jess and I, our company was, was funding this for a really long time. Um, and we had this sense, um, we had made quite, we had made the keepers for Netflix, which had gone very well. And we had this sense that like, true crime is so popular. This is like true crime on steroids. It's like the most, I mean, you mentioned Brian Fogel. Icarus was, won, won the Oscar and was a huge true crime hit. And that was about steroids. <laughs> this was like, this was about murder. Uh, this was about murder and the Kim regime. So I think we were a little bit too confident in, in the ability to sell this film. And we, we had a lot of interest from the very beginning because it is such a big story. And we knew if it were on one of the big streamers and they knew that it would play like crazy. It's the type of story that would, that would spread very fast by word of mouth. But unfortunately, these streamers are so big now, they're so global um, and they're so powerful that the Sony hack is very terrifying, understandably to them. Um, and so we had to do it very independently for a very long time um, without, you know, we were overconfident. We had uh, a group called Impact Partners that is this wonderful group that funds or partially funds a lot of documentaries. They gave us a big grant um, to get off the ground um, that floated us for a long time. Um, but yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't like all of the big companies that, uh, that it's now going to be available on demand on in a few days. We're like knocking on our door saying, oh, we want to tell a story about Kim Jong-un. They don't, um, you know, and Brian Fogel, whoever's question was about that is, is the same thing with the dissident, which is about Jamal Khashoggi's murder and the, and the Saudi Arabian government. So, but we have, it, it, it allowed us to kind of like go back to our roots in some way. We've been very lucky. If you consider getting deals with the streamers lucky, We've been very lucky um, in our past five or six projects to be with, with big streamers and they have a lot of marketing dollars. They have a lot of dollars for awards campaign. Uh, but we didn't have that at the beginning of our careers in our little independent films. 
Uh, and so it's been kind of fun in that way to go back to Scrappy and, and Greenwich, the company that's releasing our film is good at that, you know? Uh, they've done, they do a lot of independent films that um, I don't know if the streamers are afraid of, but the streamers didn't buy for whatever reason. Um, and Greenwich will put them out theatrically. Um, unfortunately, that didn't happen for us this year because of Corona. We were kind of hoping uh, that theaters would come back before our film would come out. So, you know, our hope is still that it will spread by word of mouth, even though it's not going to be available, you know, on an Amazon or a Netflix or a Hulu. Uh, I think it's going to be available on Stars eventually. Um, so tell everyone to sign up for Stars or get your free trial at least. Uh, but we're still hoping that it's, you know, that it will spread by word of mouth because I think it would have been four or five years ago, it would have been the type of film that, that, that played like wildfire on those streamers. Um, so it seems like Gigi didn't actually uh, mean to raise her hand. So I'm going to <laughs> call on Raj Bora next. But before I do, um, there was another question about, was there ever talk of the production actually trying to go to North Korea for any reason? Mm. Um, we talked about it and it was quickly, I mean, just in all honesty, it was <laughs> ruled out. It's just not, there wasn't a need to tell the story to go there. Um, we thought we could tell it without going there and it was, we were already concerned about the risks we were taking. So we didn't want to increase that risk. I do remember Helen, our editor who Darshan referenced, um, saying something about trying to track down Kim Jong Nam's um, son, who is still living, who was not, certainly not in North Korea, but he has been, you know, moved. Some people think recently there was an article that said maybe the CIA uh, has shepherded him elsewhere. But Helen was like, "Go find him," and I remember Ryan's response was like, "Said safely from your edit bay, <laughs> like <laughs> to go do that." So. It was really about, with all of it, it was about mitigating the risk. And that was a risk that didn't seem worthy. Uh, OK, so last question. We'll go out to Raj, and I'll move you over now. Wow, thank you very much, Ago. You make our evening every day good. And <laughs> really, pleasure. your film, these three of you are so great and talented and so Ryan and Darshan, oh my God. Really, you made the story and some of the films we saw that uh, we never saw on the TV on this, all this. So basically gives a total uh, complete picture of what happened. Uh, my question was related to were you available to the present tape or conversations or while doing this one? Were we, how were we able to get you, the you had a, some present conversation and tape and that was provided by the lawyer or basically you had a uh, conversation with them too. Hmm. And it ran. Are, are we talking about the conversations with the women? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I was actually, when you asked Darshan um, what one of the biggest challenges was, uh, I was surprised he didn't say, because I think this is one of the, the biggest uh, tasks that I, that I asked my editors to pull off was let's not reveal we meet the women until the end. Oh um, my God, yay. <laughs> and so because I knew we had a story that at least American audiences didn't know, I was like, this is such a rare opportunity to have real suspense in a film that is a geopolitical huge story. No one's gonna know whether these women are telling the truth or not, and no one's gonna know what happened to them in the trial. Um, and so I was hell bent on the very beginning, you know, because there's different ways you could edit this film. You could have the women telling their story throughout the film, and then you know that they're alive, um, and you know we had access to them. Um, so it was a little bit of it was a little bit of trickery. Cities, uh, cities, uh, police tape is. Uh, wait, I'm, I'm getting it wrong. Dwan had a real had a real um, uh, transcript with the police that was released afterwards, that was her police statement. Um, it wasn't, we didn't have the audio of it. Um, so once I met her, I had her read it um, and we edited it in to the film, but we didn't ever show her on camera or reveal her face um, so that we weren't revealing that she had survived this ordeal or that she had been released. Um, 
And Siti's story came from our interview with her later on. And so I just said to the editors, like, you have to edit in exactly what happened to them, but you can't show them. So I want people to not know uh, where this audio came from. Um, and so I think that was very difficult for them to have to figure out, okay, well then how, what visuals do we show? How do we keep this alive if we can't show the speaker or we have to make it, uh, you know, just someone reading a statement. Um, and so I think they really rose to that occasion in the way that they pulled that off. As, as also the North Korean basically run away, walked away this way. Did you ever plan, did you have uh, further knowledge of what happened afterwards? Did they got exposed later on or no? Or did you ever plan to interview while going on to the North Embassy uh, uh, in uh, those countries? No, the, who, who basically took the everybody out and get it uh, into the plane. Yeah, we don't know what happened to those men. I mean, we can trace their path back to Pyongyang, and then after that, you know, they're they're within the borders of North Korea. Um, you know, some people say slash joke slash very darkly joke that like maybe those men were killed right when they landed. You know, they were very public. We knew their names. Uh, they used their passports. Interpol had identified them by that point. Is the Kim regime that uh, that vicious? I don't know. Or maybe they were rewarded for what they did. We don't we don't know. The the one the one well, Ri Jong Chol, the chemist, mm -hmm. he he was sort of like all around the world. We had a we had a video of him at some point in Beijing singing karaoke while he was drinking. So <laughs> he's kind of this like freewheeling guy who's living a, a, a life of leisure somehow for having been involved in a political assassination. The one that I find the most fascinating and the scariest and the one that probably haunted me the most while making the film is James, because that's the only one that no one knows where he went. No one knows that he went, if he went back to North Korea, there's no proof of, of him ever leaving the country. So James to me was always the boogeyman of this man who could still be around the streets of Kuala Lumpur working on the behalf of the North, regime, North Korean regime and you know, come after us or the lawyers or the women after they were released and, and no one knows where he is now. Really, courage to all three of you. Excellent film. Thank you for sharing and definitely will spread the word out. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Raj. Raj. And might be Indian American too. <laughs> yes, thank you, Raj. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, send us some information. Sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Raj. <laughs> I thought you were done. <laughs> um, Guys, thank you so much. This was an amazing discussion and it's really a phenomenal film. Uh, so I hope everyone out there will do their best to get the, uh, the word out. And uh, thank you for spending the night with us and, uh, and you know, taking all of our questions. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>